اعوذبلشیطانجیم وصلاۃ وسلام علاشرفیلمبیا المخلوقین سیدنا و نبینا و شفینا ابوالقاسم محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ وسلم اما بعد فقط قال اللہ فی کتاب المبین و ہو آستق الصادقین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا ایخلدین آمن استعین و بصبر و صلاحت ان اللہ ہم صابرین سسٹرز اینڈ برادرس وی وانٹ ٹو پک اپ فرام ویئر وی لیڈ دا بیسک پلرس آف ہاؤ وی وانٹ ٹو ڈیل ود دس سبجیکٹ mainly to see what kind of lessons or messages we can extract from the behavior of the Mominin after Karbala and what they understood from Karbala. As we saw yesterday in some detail <coughs> that relying on historical narratives is not sufficient because narratives first of all are individual accounts of what they thought happened and as I showed you with a number of examples if you have some ideas you always fit what you see into those ideas so this is one problem then of course there are regimes and governments which want to direct narrative towards their own Uh, interests and that is another problem because then mm, you are forced to write what you think needs to be written or they get history written according to what they want to be done and then there is this question which actually I wanted to allude to yesterday but I it just slipped my mind I explained to you that in an era of data surveillance or in the older times of what we call pervasive mukhabarat in countries we have people not expressing what they think or what they believe in and sometimes <clears throat> a lot of our friends used to tell us that you followers are ahlul bayt are really very very difficult to judge because you practice taqiyya and A few months ago I was talking to some of them and I said Takiyah has now become mandatory because of the kind of surveillance you have. So it's not the followers of Ahlul Bayt, you will also have to practice Takiyah if you want to survive. So if <clears throat> a situation like that arises, then what you see and get in terms of actual written or recorded narratives is not what people believe in. So all these things make life very difficult for us to extract the exact outcome of things in terms of what was written about it. We are left with trying to interrogate history and see if we pick up certain things and from there we can conclude or we can derive a number of conclusions which are slightly more firmly based than the received narratives. And we saw, for example, the small anecdote of the very humble companion of the Prophet, Hujar bin Adi. This is a man, 10 years after the martyrdom of, of Imam Ali, was required to condemn or curse Imam Ali in public. And he refused and he was martyred for that. And we just read this in passing in two sentences and but if you think about it, see, ten years after the martyrdom of Imam Ali, why should you as Caliph insist on people cursing Imam Ali? What is your fear from Imam Ali? He's gone. Clearly there is something there which tells you and then if you explore that narrative further 
we will see perhaps in the last lecture that that fear is still there there is something about imam ali which strikes fear in the hearts of those who do not want to implement the islam of the prophet and karbala of course is a reminder on the way it's just one step away from imam ali <coughs> You see, this reminds me of uh, an incident, not an incident, a phase in the Christianization of Andalusia. When the uh, Christians started to take back Andalusia, they of course were confronted by this huge number of Muslims there. And they started to expel them so they said either you convert or you go both jews and uh, sorry muslims and jews huh? a lot of them left to north africa and so on but some of them converted <coughs> and then they said how do we test that you have converted to christianity so you are required to do two things you are required to and you come out of the house in the morning to curse the prophet and eat pork in public these were the two tests even now if you go to spain you will see that in every restaurant there is a pig hanging in the middle just that is a symbolism of of that time of the inquisition after a few years of this some people said look i don't think these people have converted despite what they are showing and they went to their houses and in many places they found wells had been dug and in those wells there were sort of alcoves and in those alcoves there were qurans and they found these people reading and practicing the quran in that sort of uh, environment in their own houses in very secret so see, you see i told you these people have not converted they're just showing you at that time they decided to actually kill or liquidate that is what is called the inquisition all people who were muslims so you see <clears throat> it is this kind of atmosphere which must have prevailed in the uh time of uh, post mavia where people are required to curse imam ali of course some of them may have done but this is not does not express what they believed in so we need to interrogate history a bit more to see what we can extract <clears throat> and yesterday we saw the uh, first if you like reactions to karbala so obviously the initial overwhelming response is remorse and sadness that we were not able to join the imam for whatever reasons right even now we read in the ziyarat varsa that i wish i was there i would join you and so on i don't know if the time comes if all of us will join or not but if we don't then we have the same question of how to repent for it so this tawabun um <clears throat> under the leadership of suleiman uh took 3 years to organize and then tried to do something most of them were martyred in the process and then we just came to the follow up in terms of mukhtar who rose and championed the imamat of muhammad al hanafiya who was of course one of the sons of imam ali now the tawabun confined themselves to working with mostly the arabs of kufa and some of them 
others from Yemen and Bahrain, but mostly Arabs. And they could muster three to four thousand people maximum. Mukhtar, on the other hand, realized something which is more interesting. As the Umayyad state was expanding, the uh, cities around Kufa, the area, sorry, around Kufa, had become a big garrison town and also a base for the development of agriculture in that area. For that purpose, a lot of other non-Arab converts to Islam had also come to that area. But they had instituted a system of Mawla, which is very similar to the Kafil system we have in the United Arab Emirates and things today, that you need a local wali, if you like, to hold your hand or to keep your passport or, you know, whatever, before you can act. And so these Mawali were also large numbers of them in that area. And Mukhtar started to appeal to some of them. Of course, just before uh, the rebellion in Kufa against Muslim Ibn Aqil, some of the Mawali wanted to rise up, but Abdullah ibn Ziyad, with his intricate knowledge of the tribal system and so on, was able to control that. And was he would not, and he did not allow any of them to join by threatening them, threatening their patrons, and doing all kinds of tricks so that it wouldn't happen. But Mukhtar was able to mobilize. And partly his success was due to that, because once they arose, then the limited number of pro Umayyad, hard line pro Umayyad controllers of the society were threatened. If you imagine, for example, today, if the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis and the Indians in, say, Dubai or Qatar rebel, that's the end of it, right? They're 80% of the population. As long as they don't rebel, everything is fine. But once they rebel, that's the end of it. This was a situation around Kufa at that time. And Mukhtar was able to mobilize it to some extent, and therefore he was able to defeat the Umayyads uh, for a short period of time in that area. And obviously uh, proceed to his mission, which was primarily uh, to take revenge for the events of Karbala. And we, yesterday we highlighted some of the controversies around that. We don't want to go into that. I just want to highlight this question of the Mawali. Because <clears throat> this is where I think one of the key lessons comes. If you see last series of lectures, we looked at the time of the Prophet. And we saw that... <clears throat> In his early days, the people who joined the Prophet, apart from a few lesser known people from the Quraysh and so on, most of them were at the periphery of society. So you have people like Abu Zar and Salman and Bilal and Mikdad and so on. These are not from the nobility. They are not regarded as really key part of that society. So that is one of the complaints of the Quraysh was, this man, first of all, he's not from the top Quraysh family in Makkah. And then he gathers around him all these riffraffs and wants to say, I'm the prophet and believe in me. What is he talking about? This is just not possible. And then he says that anybody who believes will be the same, whether he's Arab or Ajam. This creates havoc and headache. 
but for the people who are from that strata of society not mainstream this offers a very different message that here is a chance to rank as equal in belief rather than as subsidiary and this was a message which was going on until the time of the umayyads it started by uh, it was started by marwan bin hakam in the time of the third caliph to elevate tribe and family members over all others despite their qualifications or faults and this was one of the key factors for the undoing of uh, the third caliphate and the assassination of the caliph because marwan really overplayed his hand in this direction okay now this comes back <clears throat> and of course as i said mukhtar also realized this but the umayyads did not they created a state which of course was expanding rapidly was getting rich but that wealth was based on the labor and protection and participation of a large number of the mawalis lots of them persians some other christians uh, byzantines and others who had converted as well now what they did <clears throat> you see clearly as far as pure muslim doctrine is concerned once you become muslim you are muslim full stop but now they said if we sort of exempt them from jazia or the poll tax or the protection tax and exempt them from this and that which muslims are not uh, needing to give then we cannot sustain this tax so although they were muslim they were regarded as second class citizens so they was developing a big underclass of the mawali and looking back into their minds and somebody who was clever enough to put the idea into their minds that the only people who will give you equal status are the ahlul bayt look at their record and you will see this coming over and over as a factor in the kinds of rebellions which happened okay so <clears throat> the mayas moved in that direction until they reached a position where discontent amongst large parts of the muslim world became quite serious by the time they realized this this was in the time of uh, umar ibn abdul aziz who is probably nearly the last umayyad so after marwan and abdul malik bin marwan and others and so on umar ibn abdul aziz comes there as an umayyad governor for the first time he and that is why a lot of historians uh and a lot of uh muslims generally who were quite upset with the umayyads generally they regard umar ibn abdul aziz as an exception because he was the first one who realized this problem and he said no muslim is muslim full stop and there will be only one kind of citizenship for muslims whether it is taxes whether it is this that everything unfortunately for them it was too late they had already burnt a lot of bridges and laid the ground open for other forces to come in as we will see so you see one of the key lessons here is that <clears throat> this idea of islam as it is that everybody that arab and ajam is the same regardless and the only distinction is on the basis of taqwa although this was the doctrine 
it was not implemented in umayyad times and this was one of their big problem because they, of course their system was based on nepotism and clan it wasn't based on any other principle in fact uh, it's it's open knowledge that somebody like yazid was a drunkard and a playboy how can you have a caliph and somebody say why do you come drunk when you come to pray this is a question to ask after 50 years after the prophet to a caliph so clearly even amongst non she is scholars and ulama resentment against the umayyad behavior was growing and this added to this and so some of them tended to um, support this line so keep this in mind that behind all the support for the ahlul bayt and the family of the prophet in terms of leadership was this belief that these are the only people who will genuinely deliver a muslim state in terms of equality of muslim citizens the second thing which comes out <clears throat> is that from tawabun to muqtar to zaid to all kinds of other uh, people who came up to rise in the name of ahlul bayt they seem all to be in a great hurry and they say okay i have got enough people i'm going to attack i've got enough people i'm going to attack and one after the other they were defeated so this question of taking power by force has been a factor in the background of all this discourse through the lives of the 12 imams that whether it is advisable to take power by force if there is no conviction behind that uh, you know force and you know that is what we call dictatorship that if there is no support as soon as that dictatorship weakens it goes because this is not a system which is sustainable so we will see it seems to me that the advice of the imams and the conduct of the imams has been that this is not the course therefore we do not see them at least openly completely ever having supported any of these uprisings amongst the shia we are not talking about other groups right we are talking about their followers in fact some of sometimes they have actually condemned them sometimes they have abstained sometimes they have tried to stop them but never supported them that go and do it now there is wisdom behind it and there must be wisdom behind it and this also starts with imam ali he could have for example taken arms from day one after uh, sakifa and said okay we are going to fight this but you find that until he was proclaimed and forced to be a khalifa he never did anything in terms of actually taking up arms and neither has any other uh, imam after that so there is a message here that we have something else to do rather than just grab power for power's sake this is not something which will work and we will see what that is that brings us to the <clears throat> next question and that is the question of legitimacy of power in the post prophetic era what did muslims consider to be legitimate power because otherwise it will have to be exercised by force if we think that that is legitimate then you don't need force right you only need then force to stop miscreants but if you think this is not legitimate then you need force to exercise it all the time now here 
a lot of people say there is no evidence that uh, this uh, path was chosen by the prophet or this or that and the sources are quite all over the place right even those people for example if you look at uh, <coughs> martin lynx or abu bakr sirajuddin he is uh, quite famous biography of the prophet in this biography of the prophet <coughs> he mentions very clearly as we read it the uh, happenings at gadir khum and he said the prophet did announce man kuntu maula fa haza li un maula right he of course takes a different meaning of the term maula and so he then uh, does not go the way the followers of ahlul bayt go on that okay so the narrative is there but many people say that this was all sort of um if you like only not concerned with political power more concerned with spiritual heritage here is where we want to interrogate history right if we say that the main fear of mawia was the remembrance of imam ali as we see from the incident of hujar bin adi or even this uh, reported uh, history that for quite a number of decades cursing of imam ali in the azan was mandatory across the muslim world what we have to reaffirm the wilaya of imam ali and azan at the moment is a reaction to that because if they were cursing then really it had to be addressed back so that's a reaction to that but that's for a discussion for some other time so the fear so what was his fear of imam ali imam ali had been assassinated what is the problem and later of course even in, in the time of uh, yazid and then uh, abdul malik bin marwan and so on the same practice continued so what is this fear we see also the same fear in the abbasids as we will come just now why do they fear the line of imam ali it seems to me that there is an inbuilt and ingrained feeling there that legitimacy will only come from this line for the muslims and anybody appealing to this line will form and pose a challenge to the established order because it will be declared illegitimate in fact lots of them rose in the name of the ahlul bayt and then deviated as we will see because legitimacy was supposed to come from there the after tomorrow when we see the safavis the same thing they also capitalized on this legitimacy to come to power so it seems that if you read between the lines in history you find that there is a clear indication that there was a deep seated understanding or feeling that after the prophet the rightfully entitled leadership lay with imam ali and his followers and his successors this doesn't need any historical narrative it just needs looking at the behavior of the different players who wanted to come to power to see what will happen now as we said <clears throat> the umayyad khilafat started to lose ground when they could not accommodate the demands of the growing numbers of non arab muslims to be equal citizens and they lay themselves open to weakness and exploitation and in fact when they started to oppress people many of them went to far away places so you find that even in those days 
people uh, used to go to um, what is now South Tehran, but that time it was known as Shahrire. Others went to Khorasan, uh, which was at that time an amalgam of the present day Khorasan and parts of Afghanistan. So far enough, away from the center of power and do their own thing there and learning. As soon as they realized, many of these people, that there was some weakness at the center of power, especially that there was one other element of resistance to Umayyad power, which uh, I, we have not touched on, but very briefly, in Medina, after the death of Yazid, there was an attempt by Abdullah ibn Zubair to declare himself caliph. In fact, he did. Abdullah ibn Zubair, of course, the son of Zubair, who is one of the was one of the companions of the Prophet. Talha and Zubair are the two who actually first acknowledged the caliphate of Imam Ali and then turned tail in Jamal. So for a while, Abdullah ibn Zubair was able to control Medina, but then Abdul Malik bin Marwan was able to crush him and establish. After that, the Umayyads had complete control until they lost ha, the art of government and also lost the very basis of Islamic rule in terms of equality of Muslim citizens. So in there, <clears throat> one person in particular, who is known as Abu Muslim Khurasani. Abu Muslim Khurasani, by some accounts, was a Mawali of some of the key Arab tribes. Mawali means a sort of, uh, I don't know, a protected person. Um, maybe semi-Persian Afghan origin. And he started to push these ideas in Khurasan. And again, this is the interesting bit which we said before, he started to say, we want to work to establish the Khilafat in the name of the Ahlul Bayt. And he, he gave some very vague ideas that we will establish and then we will make a Rida as the Caliph, so some awaited one or something like that, from the family of the Ahlul Bayt. And a lot of the pro Ahlul Bayt people started to support him. Eventually they gathered enough force and they were able to capture. Uh, Kufa and Baghdad. And this later on became what we know as the Abbasid Khilafat. They put, instead of somebody from the direct family of Imam Ali, they put somebody from the family of Al Abbas, who was one of the uncles of the Prophet. And so this is why they are known as the Abbasids. The Abbasids came to power in the name of the Ahlul Bayt, but as soon as they came to power, they realized that their legitimacy was challenged as long as family of the Prophet were powerful. So they started to make trouble. In fact, from the day they came, they started to make trouble and play and then had a lot of them imprisoned um, and harassed in so many ways, including, for example, Imam Musa Qasim, who was in Medina, then uh, <clears throat> I think it was Harun Rashid who went for Hajj and he brought him back and imprisoned him. He said, I don't, can not leave you alone. Imam Jafar Sadiq was also restricted in his activities. Although all the Imams, as we said, had not openly declared any rebellion or anything against these people. But legitimacy-wise, they felt that as long as this example is there, our regime, our reign will not be legitimate. 
the abbasids on their turn <coughs> had learned from the umayyads and they took over where umar ibn abdul aziz had started they did establish quite a comprehensive state but they understood that legitimacy was a problem so what they did <coughs> instead of basing themselves in kufa which was the center of power in iraq until then they started a new city which is what nowadays is known as baghdad but they made uh, three parts of that city one when they had their own administrative headquarters they called it madinat as salam and then there was one which was a military garrison in the north and then there was a professional area in the south for agriculturists and so on and established a huge new place which is now known as baghdad because they did not want anything to do with kufa or karbala in fact during the third or fourth abbasid caliph the first time that karbala was damaged the the haramain in karbala were damaged so we see that the abbasids who came again in the name of the prophet his family betrayed them and went back and then of course established their own setup but what i mentioned that the question of legitimacy stays intact there was a clear perception that legitimacy will only come if you somehow attach yourself to the line of the ahlul bayt the imams on the other hand as we saw did not participate in any of this so what did they do and we see that one after the other they concentrated on building knowledge building their followers and informing them of the true message of islam and slowly virally this number of followers began to increase so although the apparent followers were small and decreasing the actual people who understood the message were increasing In fact <clears throat> there is one incident which shows you that this is quite an interesting possibility Hisham bin Abdul Malik bin Marwan who was the son of uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan one of the more powerful Umayyad governors after Muawiya he went for Hajj and as as people who have been to hajj know it was very very crowded and he was finding difficulty in getting into the tawaf that time he saw a person coming and people just gave way and allowed that person to move towards hajj al aswad so he asked the people who is this person and they said this is zain al abidin the people respect him so much that this is their behavior towards him and it is said and and this is true that farazdak the poet has repeated this in his poetry and has made a long poem about this noble person um, for his efforts poor farazdak was imprisoned how could you do that to how could you humiliate the caliph like this but this shows that behind the exterior there was a building up of respect for the knowledge and behavior of the people of the ahlul bayt so one of the things which happened during this time of the 12 imams and it is not a long period we are looking at karbala in 660 ad and we are looking at the passing away of imam al askari in 874 so we're looking at 220 years 
not a very long time. Three generations. And in these three generations, we saw, and we can, uh, I mean, I can list tens of rebellions like Mukhtar and Hanafiya and Zaydis and Kasaniya and all kinds of uh, rebellions from the followers. But every time these rebellions happened and they were put down, there also grew a kind of messianism, a kind of thinking that some superhero is going to come and save us from this nonsense. Although we are on the right path, why are we getting beaten back? So it also led to the development of a lot of superstitious beliefs and so on, which later on came to be known as Gulu, extremism, yeah? Ascribing supernatural powers to imams and other uh, beings and so on. Mukhtar himself said that Muhammad Hanafiya is the Mahdi and he's not died and he will come back and so on. These kind of things came over and over. So this is a period of despair where this kind of discourse also developed. But at the same time, starting with the time of Imam Bakr, fifth Imam, we had the development of what we now know as Shia theology. Uh, in terms of what are the beliefs, what is the structure of the doctrine, what are the differences, and where these things are going. This is why sometimes the school is known as the Jafari school, because it's that time that a lot of it has been codified. We will see day after tomorrow, inshallah, some details on this, how the different kinds of thinking in terms of the rise of the Mu'tazila and so on, have shaped it and see if there is any role for the events of Karbala in this uh, shaping at all. But for today, <clears throat> I want to try to summarize for us a number of factors which result from Karbala. The first one is that this idea of opportunistic rising and taking power did not work and was not encouraged by the Imams. We would say this is not the way. As I said, with the ayah of the Quran I read, that the idea is perseverance. Inna Allah sabirin. It's not patience, it's perseverance. Anything, or we say the mangoes will not ripen in a hurry. They will take their own time to ripen. We have to nurture the place for them to ripen. In the absence of that, some of the impatient people took resort to all kinds of mysticism, syncretism, extremism, and so on. And some of them are still existing. You have the Alawis and the Nuseris and so on, which, which have these beliefs. Some of the beliefs have streamed into mainstream Shiism, which still need to be properly you know, expelled. The other thing is that legitimacy in the Muslim world in that time was clearly perceived to come from the lineage of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And everybody was either trying to cut that lineage off or jump on that lineage in order to get into power. So regardless of what the narratives say, historical behavior shows us that there is some solid basis for this idea. And lastly, that this ideal of Islam, that believers are equal regardless of race, color, is something which is closer to the Ahlul Bayt than other um, people who aspire to power. This is one of the reasons why people gravitate towards the Ahlul Bayt as well. And finally, just to give you a flavor of what we want to do on Saturday, we want to start now to look at a post-Abbasid time and see how uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt fared when the Abbasids finally lost power. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله We have time for questions and answers from either side. Should start with sister side. Um, I have a question. Um, thanks for your lecture. Um, you mentioned that um, we, as she has started to include Ashhad um, ibn Ali and Wali Allah uh, as a kind of react in in Adhan, as a reaction to um, the cursing of Imam Ali in, in, in Adhan. Um, could you just tell me what kind of time period this kind of started to be um, included? And um, was it during the time of any of the Imams? Was it after? How did they respond to it if it was during um, that time? Yeah, it was. Uh, and it is quite interesting, this sort of thing um, was allowed by the early Abbasid caliphs and then banned by the later Abbasid caliphs when they turned against the Ahlul Bayt and then allowed again by the last Abbasid caliphs. So it has been up and down. But clearly, in terms of theology, it's very clearly understood that this is not part of Azan or Ikhama. Did, how, did how did the Imams themselves fare? Uh, or is I, a... I haven't seen any uh, explicit statement for or against. I think this is more a d decision to overcome the cursing. Because cursing, in fact, the cursing was more than that. <clears throat> in fact, for some period of time, many leading historians even did not consider the Khilafat of Imam Ali as a Khilafat, they just not they just glossed over it and went to straight to Abdul Malik Marwan and so on, yeah, from the third caliph. So second caliph actually, not so even they wanted to write that out of the record. So it's it's a much bigger thing. There's something that's what I'm trying to say that something in the psyche of that society that the legitimacy which derives from Imam Ali needs to be attacked if you want to survive. Otherwise, you will always have challenge to your power. Ali? Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, one of the things that you said was that uh, we're called the Jafris because it was uh, Imam Jaffar Sadiq who uh, codified uh, the laws and so on. Um, so what was the fourth Imam teaching? Because obviously he had, um, he was also teaching and, and you were saying that uh, everyone in, in Hajj, you know, parted ways and to, to let him go past. So obviously everyone knew what uh, he was he was about. So um, why wait till the sixth Imam to codify anything when actually the fourth Imam was also doing some stuff? So it's a good question, it's a difficult question. Okay. Let me give you the historical facts. The facts of the matter are that at least two factions of the followers of the Imam rose up against his wishes. The Tawabun and Mukhtar. Okay? So clearly, these teachings were not universally accepted by the followers. I'm not talking about other people, right? And because of the emergence of ideas like Mukhtar saying, I'm the Mahdi, or Muhammad al-Hanafiya is Mahdi, and somebody else saying this and that, it became important <coughs> to bring together a systematic body of knowledge. I'm not saying this thing didn't exist before. I'm saying it was now formalized so that you could refer to something and say, this is what it is. Anything else? But even so, after Imam Jafar Sadiq as well, uh, after the passing of every Imam, there has been a number of factions saying that this is the right one, and this is the right one, and this is the right way, and that is the right way. It only settled down. Um, about 500 years after that, 
So it's been quite a flux. Now, this could be, as we said, because of the kind of uh, situation in that society of surveillance and repression. It could be because of lack of communication between different parts. It's not like today. And it could be that there are a large number and the role of the Imams was actually to actually produce a large number of informed followers who would then take this matter further. From this side. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Okay, so you are saying that there's some recognition, tacit recognition, that the uh, line the correct lineage is through Imam Ali alayhi salam. Um, you also said um, the other day um, that in Jahili there was a lot of intertribal fighting. So I'm just thinking, is the di difficulty with Hashim? Bani Umayyah has a difficulty with Bani Hashim, and this is um, going on in history. And people don't necessarily know why, but it's going on and on. Could this be one reason? Okay, so here, <coughs> clearly, definitely, uh, Banu Umayya have got a problem with Banu Hashim because Banu Umayya think that they were the more stronger and what you call superior tribe of the Quraysh, not the Banu Hashim. They were actually the controllers of Makkah. So now, in the beginning, when the Prophet announced his prophethood. One of the reactions from the Banu Umayya, Abu Sufyan and so on, so who is this upstart from this part, yeah? I mean, we are entitled to this. And he said, when he converted, as I said, he said, we will take it back. So clearly that is there uh, in that context. But as you go out of that context, that has less and less draw, yeah? Because now the numbers are really outside of the Quraysh, right? or outside of that uh, context. Then you have this third element of Banu Abbas coming in as well, right? Which, but what I'm trying to say is that all of them either have to appeal to the lineage or try to destroy it. Why this should be so? Is there some problem there? Or is there something in the uh, minds of those people that this is the right one? Yeah? This, is, this is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, of course, those things are there. And what um, Ibn Khaldun has a very interesting observation on this. <clears throat> Ibn Khaldun, in his Muqaddima, as you know, the Muqaddima uh, to the history of the world is a kind of sociology of how civilizations come into being and how they decay and so on. We'll look at some of these in the next couple of lectures. But one of the facts he says is that generally the development of societies is based very much on what he calls asabiya, which is in a very simplistic sense blood relationships, right? And he, uh, of course, this is, he says, this is a general rule I observe across my reading of history and so on that is really blood relationships, people sort of gather together on that basis and they promote each other and then they grow and they, some of them become successful and so on. Then he goes on to how people fall down and so on. This is also interesting. But the more relevant part for us is that he says in this small episode of the lifetime of the prophet, this historic law was disrupted that a lower level person from that relationships was able to take over and attract support. And he said one way to view post-prophet timing is the assertion of the basic rule of Asabiya back onto the prophetic model. So you see the Umayyad model coming on top. He said this is now again taking history back on its course rather than trying to deviate it. That's an interesting observation on that.
Um, salam. Um, you mentioned that uh, Abu Muslim al Khurasani managed to, kind of from Afghanistan or that region, managed to get an army to eventually topple the Umayyads. I just wanted to ask, like, where did he get his army from if he came from that region? Um, yeah, from, uh, some of them came from there, and some then, of course, he allied, because of his uh, pro Ahlul Bayt discourse, he found supporters within Kufa and other places, and then they, and the Mawalis and so on, and they all then. So, but the impetus came from there. And that was a rich region at that time, mind you. It was growing and it was rich. Uh, sorry, yeah, but if you put the map, you will see that in terms of the block of uh, you know uh, uh, progress that was a big area huh? and the revenues from that area were big and those guys were taxed differently from the core people and so they had a lot of grievances to be mobilized um question from me we we're talking quite a, a little bit about the reaction um, of uh, Muawiyah and, and other people um, because they had all this uh, cursing, for example, this is a reaction to the legitimacy uh, of the Ahlul Bayt. Is there any um, truth or, or potential validity for the next step in terms of a lot of the um, cursing that comes within the Shia tradition uh, and the, uh, the, the tradition of the Ahlul Bayt being a reaction to, to that kind of cursing as well. Is this cursing something that is just a, a natural pr part of life or is it something that was instituted as some sort of uh, reaction? I don't know. I can only guess. I think uh, my guess would be that, you know, one of the developments in this period was the rise of the what is known as the Zaidi school. Uh, this one tried to mix and match. So they accepted the first two caliphs and then they went to the Ahlul Bayt from Imam Ali and they forgot about the third caliph altogether. And then they went to the Ahlul Bayt, right? And they said, after that, it must stay within the Ahlul Bayt. And a dispute started within the followers of the Ahlul Bayt that this is not possible. How can you accept this and then this? This this mix and match doesn't work. It seems to me that this would have originated in that kind of milieu, that we must be clear. Whether it is right or wrong is a different question, but you can see the origination of this kind of discourse. Um, the lecture was great to give us an idea of the uh, political forces that manipulated information and thinking at the time. I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the masses, um, people who were either of the blissfully ignorant category or who were suspicious, or if not suspicious, just having to navigate through <laughs> this miasma of, of the historical distortion and narrative distortion, because that seems to me a position that we all might face ourselves in today. And, and how, did, how would a person at the time, or even us today, move through these distortions? So you see, uh, it's, it's always very, very challenging to predict when the tide will turn, right? So we, we, for, we saw, for example, even before Karbala, that you had a lot of anti umayyad sentiment in Kufa, which was expressed in those letters to Imam Hussain, right? But in terms of actual backing of that letters, when push came to shove, when your life was at risk, when you had other all kinds of different considerations to take, it didn't materialize. At other times, we see that for a short period of time, things seem to have materialized. What this narrative shows is that there has always been an underlying resentment of Umayyad power definitely and lately of Abbasid power. 
but in order to mobilize it to success has been difficult and either they have been able to crush it or divide and rule they have been able so some of them actually harnessed parts of it and said so this uh, abbasids for example from time to time as i said become very pro and then become very anti and so on so they have been also adept at playing this game and we face the same problem i mean we say very confidently in our ziyara and things that if the imam comes we will join you and we are waiting to join uh it is a open question how many will but that doesn't mean that we don't harbor any sympathies or any resentment for the present order right but for the, for those resentments to materialize into actual action this is something which is unpredictable Okay, I think we'll end the uh, salawat. <laughs>